Liskov's Substitution Principle. Liskov references Barbara Liskov, a the creator of the substitution principle. In 1987, Barbara Liskov created a mathematical formula for ensuring that parent classes and children classes are substitutable with each other. Her mathematical definition is a specific implementation of what is known as strong behavioral subtype. Now, a class can have behavior. This behavior is defined by a class's functions or methods. A subtype is a child class that inherits its functionality from the parent class. When a child class inherits its functionality from a parent class, it is what is known as a subtype. So that's the behavioral subtype, strong behavioral subtype. Now strong references stricter, more regulated or highly enforced rules. Liskov's substitution principle is a specific implementation of strong behavioral subtypes. This just means we're going to enforce stricter rules on our child classes when we override parent behavior, aka parent functions. Typically, when a child overrides a parent function with its own function, when it overrides its parent behavior with its own behavior, we're no longer able to ensure that that child is substitutable at every location in our software where we can use that parent. This is where the Liskov substitution principle comes in. We can break this mathematical formula down into five simple rules. Here are the five rules that a child class must abide by when overriding parent behavior to enforce it is still substitutable with its parent. Number one, function arguments of the child class must match the function arguments of the parent class. Number two, the method return type must match the method return type of the parent class. Number three, preconditions, postconditions, these are something we will cover here in a second. But number three is that the preconditions of a child class can be no greater than the preconditions of the parent class. Number four, the post conditions of a child function cannot be lesser than the preconditions of the parent function. Number five, so when the child method throws an exception, it has to be the same as or child of the exception thrown by the parent method. So we are going to implement each of the five rules that are defined by Liskov's substitution principle and they're specifically translated from Liskov's or Barbara Liskov's mathematical formula. So start off with we're just going to create a parent class. This parent class is going to have a public ID and it's going to have a public function set ID. We're going to call this ID, just like that. Next, we're going to do child class. We're going to do this ID equals ID. Then we're going to do public ID and then we're going to do public function set ID, ID. Okay. So rule number one, the arguments of the child function must match the argument of the parent function. Well, this includes the type. So we need to actually add int into both of these. We have to enforce that the ID is int. This ID equals ID. Okay. Rule number two is that the return type must match that of the parents. The child function return type must much match that of the parents. So this is going to be the same thing. If we are actually following Liskov's substitution principle, then we need to define our return type. 
So we're just going to say, okay, we're not returning anything. So the return type is void. So because we are actually following the parent's return type, we're returning void, we are following rule two. If we were to return int like this, it did return this ID. We are no longer following Liskop's substitution principle. If we just say string ID, and then we did void, we are no longer following Liskop's substitution principle. We need to match the types of the arguments, the actual argument variables themselves, so we can't add an argument. We can't say and name here. That would also break Liskop's substitution principle. Instead, we need to do the exact argument and the exact return type of the parent. The child must match that of the parent. Okay, so before we go on to step three or rule three and rule four of Liskop's substitution principle, we need to understand preconditions and postconditions. So let's break this down to the absolute simplest form we can. We'll do a simple function, we'll call this add five to number, just like this. Now, all we really want to do is just say total equals number plus five. And then we want to return our total. So a precondition would be if we said, okay, hey, if number is a int, integer number, if not an integer number, throw new exception. This is a precondition. A post condition would be saying, okay, post condition, if is not an integer, total throw new exception. So a precondition is a conditional that happens before we execute a functionality, a piece of functionality. A post condition is what happens after we are done executing that functionality. So we are preconditionally checking to confirm that we have an integer, that number, that the parameter is an integer. And then we are post conditionally checking that the total is also a number. And then we return the total. So that's preconditions and post conditions. Now another form of preconditions and post conditions would actually be replacing this precondition with int and now we can remove that because if it's not an integer it will throw an error then we can replace the post condition by enforcing the return type as int so now we also can confirm that the total is an int and then in doing that we can just return number plus five and now we have successfully refactored our precondition as the typing on our parameter or our argument, which is number, and we've refactored our post condition as the typing on our return value. So that's preconditions and post conditions in a nutshell. So let's move on to rule number three. The preconditions of a child function cannot be greater than the preconditions of the parent function it is overriding. Okay, so let's create a file class. This file class is going to have a parse function that accepts a file and then all it's going to do in this function is parse the file right but then we create a child class and we call this JSON file and that's going to extend from file right but then we go and we add the public function parse file method right here and we do this we do if path info for the file extension no nope. path info extension does not equal JSON throw a new exception then parse the JSON file this breaks Liskov's substitution principle we have added a precondition that the parent 
function does not have. So the preconditions of the child method are greater than the preconditions of the parent method that it is overriding. Breaks list gap substitution principle. We are not able to substitute JSON file and the class of file anywhere in our application because we are now checking to confirm that we are properly passing in the right file. So this will throw an error when file doesn't. Um, so it's it's we are not able to substitute JSON file everywhere where file is able to go. Um, so this is incorrect. So let's redo that example, but let's build it out the right way. A lot of these solid principles are really closely related. One of the rules is to code to a contract. Let's create an interface and let's call it file. Then let's create a public function construct and that's going to accept a string file, which is going to be the file path. Next, let's create a JSON file. This is going to implement implements file. Notice that we get the red squiggly because class must be declared abstract or implement method construct, right? So then we're going to do public function construct string file. We're going to do this file equals file. Then we're just going to do public file. Next, we're going to go up to our interface. We're going to do public function parse. And then this is going to return void, or sorry, not return void, is going to be left empty. Then we're going to do parse. And all this is going to do is this is going to use this file and then whatever you need to do to parse JSON from this file. So this allows us to keep creating different types of files. And let's just copy that JSON file. Just like this. And use HTML file implements file and parse HTML file. So we've properly refactored, and now if we need to create a function that's like read from read from file, we can pass in the abstraction. And then we can just do file parse. So let's move on to rule number four. The post conditions of the child cannot be lesser than the post conditions of the parent. So this is also going to be pretty similar to the, eh, kind of similar to open close principles. A lot of these things share, share similarities. So let's say in the JSON file, we can use JSON within our application. And we have a specific place where we want to use it. So we're just going to do return JSON decode. And then we'll just do content equals we'll do parsed JSON content, right? Then we're just going to do JSON decode content, which will return an associative array. Okay. So we parse JSON using this file and we just got back these brackets, right? No biggie. Um, but then we are going to return JSON decode content, which would be an array. And just because I'm not 100% sure if I have the right syntax here, I'm just going to return an array. But basically we just JSON decode and we get an associative array from our JSON content file because we can use JSON in our application. But our HTML file, well, if we have content equals true, we just want to return if we have content, right? We just want to do if content return true. One, we're doing another uh, precondition we shouldn't be doing, or a post condition we shouldn't be doing. If content return true, else return false, that's a post condition right there. So we'd be breaking Liskov substitution principle 
by just checking if content exists, return true, otherwise return false. Then you're thinking, now ah, we could probably just return content, right? Well, we could in some cases and just see if it's empty or not. But then, what if we go down here and we do content equals that? Well, we can actually break the post conditions rule within whatever is digesting the output. So we have to do, so for example, if we do if is array, if content is an array, do this, else if content is a boolean, do that. Well, we're also breaking the post conditions rule here as well. So to fix this, what we can do is we can enforce the return type to be a boolean, or we can enforce the return type to be an array. And it has to be one or the other. We have to return the same thing. So let's get over here and let's just say okay you know what we'll we'll just return a boolean let's just make sure we were able to pat or parse the content right or maybe we'll return void just like that and and we're not going to return anything we're just going to parse it and then this will handle whatever it needs to do and so then we'll do this parse parse Boom. Then we can just do file parse. Know our file got parsed. Whatever it needs to do, wherever it needs to output that information, the parse function will handle it, but it won't affect the rest of our application because we're not returning anything. Wherever it needs to output that content, whether it be an HTML file or a JSON file, it has to do it within the parse function. So we have eliminated the post conditions that we don't need um, so the post conditions cannot be lesser on the child um, so that leads us to five and we kind of already went over this in rule three and that's just if we throw an exception here if false throw new exception well that exception has to be the same as or a child of a the parent exception um, in an interface though because we're coding to an interface we shouldn't need to throw the exception because we're already enforcing our preconditions and post conditions and the interface will handle the exceptions and lead us to the you know to the right method and if your code is so long where you need to like write 300 400 lines of code in a single method then I would say that uh, you're probably not writing it right or correctly. So really, if you're implementing an interface, you shouldn't, as long as you are following this job and you're enforcing the parameters and the return type, you really shouldn't have to uh, throw many exceptions within the class that implements those interfaces. Because when the interface does not work, it will bring you to the exact line of code or the exact method where that exception does not exist but still gets thrown because the parameter types and the return types were incorrect which are contractually binding for implementations of the file interface Seven.